We are back. We are the coalition. Loud and proud. Outrage porn free. Civilly disobedient media. Of course, broadcasting live at the Worldwide Coalition Media Headquarters here at the Go Local Live Center at 90 Way Bossy Street in the city we love, Providence, Rhode Island. The naked city, the city of 1,000 stories. As we always say, it's a dark and steamy night here in the Las Vegas of the East where there are more ways to sin than even Tony and I can ever imagine. But joining me on the line right now is someone who, as we like to say, is libertarian fabulous. By the way, stay tuned for a website of that name where we assemble all the audio and video of libertarian national leaders who have joined us in the past few weeks as we attempt to get the word out to libertarian folks nationwide. We learned during the Marcus Wicks campaign that libertarians from around the country can impact strongly impact the support, the participation, the fundraising of our candidates across the country. It's a lesson that we need to extrapolate around races everywhere. So folks running for the United States Congress, for Senate, for governorships, and soon even at the state and local level, we're going to get as many of you on as we can in the next year or so here on the Coalition Radio so we can share the love, put you up on a website, try to promote other libertarians from across the country who are waking up to the fact that it is equally important to elect a libertarian in New Hampshire as it is Montana, as it is California, or wherever you're from. Joining me on the line is my good friend. He, as I mentioned in the run-up to this segment, the only congressman I will ever be able to claim to have met for the very first time, handing out petitions at a stop and shop. And of course, I'm talking about Justin O'Donnell. He is running for the United States Congress, I believe in the second district of the great state of New Hampshire. Justin, welcome to the coalition. Thanks for having me, Dad. Oh, this, this is great. First of all, you know, we've had a couple of folks on the show, uh, but there are people in the movement who are the genuine good guys of the movement, the, the folks who, as we like to say, show up for the opening of an envelope. If you need help, they're there. You need help social media, they're there. If you they need support doing phone banking, petitioning, fundraising, they're there. You need some extra folks at your state convention to fill up the seats. They're not only there, but they're dragging their friends and family with them. If there is ever a good guy in the Libertarian Party, it is clearly Justin O'Donnell. John, Justin, again, welcome to the show for the first time. I can't believe this is the first time we're having you on. You're going to be a regular part of the show going forward because at this very moment, and this is a, this is a metaphor for life here, you are passing from the People's Republic of Massachusetts into the free state where you, you live. Um, Tell us about your path to becoming a big L as well as a small L libertarian. You weren't always such like most of us. There's a path involved. And then we're going to get into what you want to accomplish as a United States Congressman. Let her rip, buddy. Uh, well, well, I think my path is one that uh, a lot of people within the Libertarian Party have taken. And it's not even unique one to me. I grew up in a very conservative household in Massachusetts, knowing we were the political minority. I was taught from a very young age by my parents, you vote Republican. Uh, Republicans are the only ones that care about you. The Democrats are just trying to take everything you have. <laughs> they weren't wrong. It was at least half that statement. Uh, but they instilled in me the big R, big Republican morals. It was duty to your country. It was you had an obligation to serve. Uh, and I had grown up with a fascination of the military, and I ended up joining the military at 18 years old while I was in college. I joined the Massachusetts National Guard. While in college, um, I went to the one conservative-leaning university in the state of Massachusetts, the Democratic People's Republic of Massachusetts, as it was referred to in, within the confines of that campus. Uh, but it was also the only military school in Massachusetts as well, very conservative-leaning teachers. Uh, social sciences professors who were not afraid to lean towards YouTube, show you libertarian values, um, bring up up-and-coming YouTube stars like Julie Borowski. Uh, Julie Borowski at the time was somebody who kind of caught me in a niche. It was between Julie Borowski uh, and her weird antics and the way of reaching out to kids and showing young, impressionable college kids that libertarianism was for us. Uh, combined with, at the time, I think the turning point was with Rand Paul's filibuster of the drone program. When Rand Paul got up and spoke for 18 hours about the government being a travesty and forcing away American civil liberties. 
and all of that culminated, and I had put out a social media post about this actually a couple weeks ago. Um, I'd say it was July 4th, 2013, was really the culmination of everything. Um, I was one of the first responders at the Boston Marathon bombing with the Massachusetts National Guard. I was there on the security detail. A few weeks later, 4th of July, the governor had decided to activate in force as much of the National Guard as was able to be mobilized for security in the city of Boston. We had military checkpoints on every bridge uh, leading to where people could watch the fireworks. Uh, there, were, there was a comment in a newspaper uh, about the low attendance where somebody interviewed said they felt like there was more guns, cops, and soldiers than there was people actually enjoying the holiday. Mm -hmm. And during that day, while I was uh, in command of several checkpoints, um, I was patrolling uh, with my lieutenant at the time between two checkpoints. And we came across a young man who just sat in front of us in a lawn chair in the middle of the sidewalk and started reading a book. And he started reading George Orwell's 1984. My lieutenant at the time, a young recent college grad, did not understand the significance of that, did not understand what the young man in front of us was signaling by reading that book. The fact that we had mounted surveillance cameras every hundred feet along that causeway, that we had police and militarized checkpoints all throughout that city. Nobody with a hand of anything bigger than a small handbag was going unsearched as they moved through that city. And Dan just sit down and read a book about the surveillance state of the United States becoming so prevalent that civil liberties were destroyed and were no longer. It really clicked with me and it wasn't just seeing it. It was when the lieutenant, the second lieutenant, fresh out of college, who I was patrolling with, asked what was so funny when I laughed and asked what the book was about. And when I had to explain the premise of 1984 and the, the themes of the book to the lieutenant and how it was relevant, that's when it clicked with me that we were what was wrong. Mm -hmm. That what I was doing there, that with me being part of that situation as a member of the United States Army, actively participating in a surveillance operation to crush the freedom of movement and the free civil liberties and the freedom from unreasonable search that the people of Boston, the home of the American Revolution, where we first took a stand for our civil liberties, was being crushed and I was an active participant of it, was when I made the conscious decision that I could no longer support the ideology of the Republican Party that I had grown up with, that I could no longer support the militarized complex that was U.S. foreign policy, that I could no longer willingly partake in that issue. Um, and that's when I think that was my defining moment. That's when I made the switch to the Big L Libertarian Party, and that's when I started doing my research. Uh, that's when I started meeting people like Dan Fisher, the political director of the Libertarian Party in Massachusetts. Uh, that's when, at the time, I met Heather Mullins, who was running for state senate um, as a libertarian in the district where I lived. And that's when I started following people like Carla Howell, who would run for governor of Massachusetts as a libertarian and got a substantial double-digit percentage. Mm -hmm. And that's what I realized even in, uh, we want to call it the hellscape of Massachusetts, that there was people actively fighting to preserve our civil liberties. So that's people actively fighting for libertarian ideals. And since I've moved to New Hampshire, I've seen that tenfold. We have state representatives who are actively defecting from the major parties, who are actively coming out and speaking that their caucuses do not represent their ideals, that are actively going out to their constituents and saying, no, I'm not a Republican, I'm a Libertarian. And it's people like Caleb Dyer, Joseph Salkoff, and Brandon Finney in New Hampshire that are leading that charge and leading the way. And they're not doing it alone. There is a large, large contingent of people behind the scenes um, who make these things happen. I was involved in ballot access, like you said. You met me in front of a stop and shop in North Attleboro, handing out petitions to get Gary Johnson and Bill Well on the ballot. Mm -hmm. um, I was not the only one doing that, and it's the dedication of others who did that before me that makes me believe that this party has the potential to truly change the landscape of political ideology in this country. That's fabulous. Something I don't think you and I have ever talked about. I worked in Watertown at the time of the Boston bombings, and so I saw firsthand 
what happened in terms of the imposition of what I'll call martial law, uh, American citizens being rousted from their homes in what turned out to be a fruitless search, that the failings actually, and it's controversial, but ultimately was the failings of the law enforcement community in maintaining and using their already extraordinary powers to prevent something like the Boston bombing from happening. It was their failure that actually created, if you will, on multiple levels, the scenario for the Boston bombing to have happened. And then what I mean by that is, despite this overwhelming intelligence gathering devices... In and it wasn't even that. It was their failure. So, so their, the intelligence was there. The Boston Marathon right. could have been prevented. Right. The Boston Marathon bombing could have easily been prevented as if we were willing to cooperate with the international community. Instead, we've developed such a posture of aggression with our foreign policy that we discount what comes from foreign countries in the forms of help if they're not someone we consider a close ally. Okay. We, if it comes from England, France, Israel, we give it consideration. But when the FSB and Russian intelligence approached the FBI and said, hey, we have info on these two Chechen kids that we picked up and interrogated who might be connected to terrorist organizations and are planning something in Boston, the FBI did interrogate them, and then wrote off the intelligence as discountable. Right. And which is why, in, the, in the, the remarkable show of bravado by then Mayor Benito and the law enforcement apparatus dissipated quickly in a matter of a couple of days, once it became apparent that law enforcement, in fact, their failures helped to create the environment for which this happened. Um, it, it was really, but watching American citizens then cheer for the very organization that ultimately didn't even catch the bombers. Uh, I mean, remember, let's be blunt, folks, uh, I'm as proud to be an American as anyone, but it was sheer accident and happenstance that led to, ultimately, the arrest of the surviving Zernaya brother. It, it was not by any overwhelming force of military or, or any sort of military intelligence. A guy walked out of his house. In fact, the only connection really to big government that you could claim in the apprehension of the Zarnea brother was the fact that under this witch hunt we have against cigarette smokers, the guy felt compelled to go outside and have a smoke, and that's when he noticed some guy bleeding in a boat he had parked out back. Um, you know, I'm being facetious, but not so much, am I? Ugh. And no, and it even goes deeper to that, even the military and law enforcement action to apprehend on it was not the most disconcerting issue to me. It was in the immediate weeks after that. There was a discussion. There was an active discussion in Massachusetts, um, very active on Facebook. News media was talking about it was whether or not Zarnayev should be arrested and tried or be treated as an enemy combatant who committed an act of war and sent to Guantanamo Bay. And there was an active discussion, and they had active traction with people demanding that, no, he didn't deserve a trial. He was caught red-handed. He needed to be shipped off to Gitmo, locked up for life, or maybe even executed. He didn't deserve to see the light of day. And to me, the fact that Americans as a whole did not see the immediate problem with that line of thought, sure, he may have been a terrorist. Sure, he may have committed an act of war, he may have done so with the intention of committing an act of war, he was a U.S. citizen. Right. And, and he, he had those rights to a fair and speedy public trial guaranteed to him as one of his basic, fundamental civil rights as a U.S. citizen. And based on his actions alone, or his perceived actions, with no trial, with no public discovery of evidence, with no preponderance of motive, they wanted to strip him of those rights because he did something scary. Right. And, 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 and how often... Well often attributed to Thomas Jefferson, those who would sacrifice liberty in the name of security don't deserve either. But I disagree with that. I believe everyone does deserve their liberty regardless of their ill intentions. Exactly. You know, it's the... the, the, the and, and how often do we see a government apparatus, without lapsing into conspiracy theory here, but, but a government ap apparatus so willing to engage in a rush to judgment, very often tied into, let's just say, obscuring or obfuscating their own incompetence. You know, it's, it's, we've been talking about that all night, that in effect tragedy almost always in this country seems to lead to bad policy, bad government, and abuses of civil rights, 
regardless of how egregious the situation. We elect leaders to do the right thing as opposed to, in the words of the immortal Bart Simpson, I'm sorry, Mom, the mob has spoken. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, what can you say? Now, you're, so you, you, you became a libertarian, and you have, you, you, have, you have jumped right into the heart of the party, seemingly overnight. I mean, in a matter of a few years, you're everywhere, working your butt off. Um, what, what are some of your favorite memories of the last couple of years? You've, you've been intimately involved for the last, say, three, four years at, at literally every level of the party. But what, what, are, what are your favorite memories and some of the favorite things you've done? Um, I, I, I truly think the petition drive, the 2016 petition drive for 50 state ballot access, I was involved in all of New England helping um, in every state try and secure that ballot access except Connecticut because Connecticut has a really dumb state law on the books that said that out-of-state residents couldn't petition. Right. They got that overturned, just not in time for me to help. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it wasn't just the act of what we were doing. It's that every day I got to go out make a difference. I was active, actively working towards something that would make a difference. Whether or not Gary Johnson won that election, the fact that four million people went to the ballot box and cast their vote for other. Right. They, did, they, they cast off the notion that Republicans and Democrats were the only option. That, that shows that the highest vote total we've ever achieved that we were becoming legitimate. We managed to get on all 50 states, something that hadn't been done in decades. We managed to not only get on the ballot, we all managed to get on the ballot and be seen as a legitimate choice by a sizable percentage of this nation, whether or not the mainstream media wanted to notice it. And we did it at almost cost, at almost negligible cost. In Massachusetts, we had volunteers out daily all over the state. Thomas Simmons had his proof positioning, not just for him on the ballot, but Gary Johnson. We had state rep candidates carrying two sets of petitions in their hands when they were uh, going around. When we went up to New Hampshire, New Hampshire came down that they were in dire straits of not getting enough petitions <clears> signed. <throat> My team went up to New Hampshire, and it wasn't just a few people from Massachusetts that came with me. We had people from Maine. We had people from Vermont. Um, Lou Jasikoff came up from Pennsylvania to help petition in New Hampshire. And I managed to meet him in the parking lot of a market basket in Nashua. It was the first time I ever actually got to meet Lou um, from two different worlds, but working towards a common cause. And it instills the dedication of the people we're working with. It shows how far everyone is willing to go to put their values, their morals, and their principles ahead of their own personal well-being. Uh, plenty of people were taking time off from work. Uh, people were using sick days to come out and help petition. We had people calling out, on, uh, giving up overtime shifts to come help us with sign waves on Route 9. Um, knowing that the minimalistic chance we had of actually winning, people were still willing to give up their personal daily routine to help us have an impact, whether or not it would win. And it's it shows with the Libertarian Party operating with the philosophy that we may not win, but we're going to have an impact. We have had a substantial impact in the last 40 years as a party. Mm -hmm. um, there was a time where both major parties, Republicans and Democrats, thought gay marriage was a terrible idea and we shouldn't even consider it. Guess right. what? Now it's legal in all 50 states because Libertarians persisted and made it a mainstream issue. Mm -hmm. Marijuana decriminalization and legalization is becoming mainstream in all 50 states today because libertarians are fighting the issue and making it a mainstream issue and forcing independent Republican and Democratic voters to think about it in a grander perspective. Um, in New Hampshire alone, um, our governor is not a libertarian. Our governor is not a little a libertarian, uh, masquerading as a Republican. But public sentiment has pressured our legislature into doing libertarian things. We have marijuana decriminalization, constitutional carry, and they're pushing to repeal over 1,200 onerous regulations on small businesses in the state of New Hampshire this year alone. And how's that working? out? we don't have a majority. All right. We only have three or 400 state reps. And how's that working out for the average resident of New Hampshire? The average resident of New Hampshire is seeing their freedom exponentially increase. 
And that due to the activism of people like Daryl Perry, the chair of the New Hampshire Libertarian Party, Zaletta Jarvis, she's our secretary, but also a perennial candidate. She gets her name up there and her message out there. Max Abramson, who ran for governor last year on a very low budget campaign. Almost all of the money was spent just getting on the ballot. And then his entire campaign was him actually being him, going out, talking to people, shaking hands, and spreading his message. And he still got 4% of the vote. It's people like Caleb Dyer, our first state representative in New Hampshire as a libertarian, who goes door to door, who actively goes out of his way to participate in his local Republican town caucus because he wants their feedback and he wants to let them know what he's doing in the state house as their representative. There's people like Joseph Stalcom, who switched to the Libertarian Party after an experience in North Dakota protesting against the pipeline. And he found libertarian ideals coincided with his Democratic leanings more than the Democratic Party did. People like Brandon Finney, who was a party line Republican, but came to realize that the party line Republican just favored big taxes, who's made the switch to the Libertarian Party and is going out of his way to inform his constituents of why. It's people willing to go out and do the messaging to tell the people of New Hampshire, yes, we're expanding your freedom. Here's how we're doing it. Here's why we're doing it. And here's why it matters. So on all the issues that the state would have us control. And we spent the better part of this evening, and, you know, you get a chance later on to listen to the, the podcast. We had a gentleman from the, uh, from Arizona talking about the collusion that exists between municipal and state governments and, and the court system, and how that reduces people's individual freedoms, contributes to social unrest, and at the same time creates slaves to the state. In the second hour, we talked with a range of people decrying, if you will, a new law in Rhode Island that allows the state to have warrantless access to prescription medical records. The state simply, the state model of central control, central planning, is failing miserably everywhere. It, is it time for Americans to wake up and understand that you are entitled to a life of self-determination, that you are entitled to a life of liberty, and you are entitled to pursue your own personal dreams in the manner in which you choose as long as it accrues harm to no one. Is it time for the rest of the nation to understand the non-aggression principle? It's not time for that. The time for that is long overdue. Mm -hmm. um, there was a time where this country understood that implicitly. There was a time where nothing happened in this country without consideration of those two facts. Um, it's a sentiment often misrepresented by the libertarian slogan or libertarian catchphrase, taxation is theft. Um, taxation and theft comes down to the ultimate end goal of that, but it doesn't actually address the concerns and the meanings and how you arrive at that. The, the fact that the United States government, the local and state governments, can demand a portion of your earnings, that they can claim ownership of the production of your labor, that the, the means that you need to survive on, that they can demand a certain percentage of what you've earned is now means that they own your labor, that they own your labor and they own you. Taxation is theft, taxation is slavery. And until the people of the country come to the realization that they're not simply being lied to, they're not simply being oppressed, they're being enslaved by a system designed to keep them down and actively choose to revolt against that system. When we see people mass protests in Washington and in cities across the country demanding funding for Planned Parenthood, we need to get people to wake up to the fact that the government at every level, state, local, federal, is keeping them down and only exists to infringe upon their freedoms. When we can organize a march of freedom, when we can have 4 million people marching 10 major cities across the country demanding their own civil rights back regardless of race, religion, color, creed, gender identity, or any other form, and come together as human beings who are being oppressed, that's the next revolution we'll see, and that'll be the bloodless revolution. The force of the American people to throw off the chains of their own slavery, overcome the government burdens, and reclaim their own liberty. Excellent. Now let's run through some issues. We've got about 20 minutes left. I want to, you know, 
get for folks, and if you're just joining us, by the way, you are listening to the coalition live on the Worldwide Coalition Media Network. Joining us is someone who is truly embodies the notion of being libertarian fabulous. Of course, he is Justin O'Donnell. He is running for the United States Congress. Second, second congressional district, uh, Justin, as I remember? Yes. Okay. Yes, that. And, the, and the great state of New Hampshire. I consider him a personal friend. I consider himself him to be a hero of the movement. But more importantly, what tonight he's addressing is the issues. And one of the things that you'll notice about libertarian candidates, you don't have the cult of personalities surrounding libertarian candidates that you have in other mainstream political movements. What I mean by that is... What's central to the argument, the discussion, the philosophy is personal, individual liberty and the issues that would attack that. That is first and foremost. If we have a cult of personality, the personality that we are loyal to, that we look to, is liberty in and of itself. So let's, let's look at some issues through a libertarian eye from someone running for these United States Congress. Um, let's talk about military defense. Uh, We've got a nation now that is gearing up again for yet another expansion, I believe, in nation building. How do you feel about nation building and the impact it's had on our country and our national defense? Uh, well, this is particularly a hot button issue right now within the Libertarian Party itself. Um, and it's an issue that I don't understand why it's an issue. Um, there's people arguing both sides where we need to support the military or we just need to abolish it altogether. Our primary focus, we, the military should exist for the defense of the people of the United States and the defense of their values and freedoms. It, it, it does not exist to be used for the whim of politicians to send young boys and girls overseas to die, to fight, to kill, to serve corporate and political interests that have no direct threat to the well-being, safety, or liberty of people here in the United States. Now, we may want to cast off the borders debate, too, and say that our responsibility is to preserve the liberty and well-being of everyone on Earth. Yes, long-term, great. My idea is why don't we make that work here first? Why don't we make it work and then invite everyone to join us once we have what we need? Why are we going around causing problems? The Syrian civil war was precipitated not by us. It was caused due to just civil unrest. It would have ended quickly had we not intervened and armed the moderate rebels, who then split into factions and became a major terrorist organization that almost, that almost took over the entirety of Syria and half of Iraq, undoing decades worth of work in rebuilding Iraq that we had just spent hundreds of billions of dollars on and thousands of American lives, not to mention the millions of Iraqi lives that were lost in the process. Mm -hmm. Our continued military interventionism, our explorationism, our getting involved in things that do not concern the safety of our own people is doing nothing but destabilizing security around the world, of causing problems, creating power vacuums, and inviting chaos. We need to draw back our military expansionism. We need to focus on a small, capable, direct force that can defend the United States against invasion or attack. And we do not need to focus on an ability to invade a country that poses no tangible threat to the safety and security of American citizens. We're involved literally in dozens of wars around the globe now. Dozens of wars. Um, all of which were local in origin, and some would argue that we are doing nothing but trying to protect the economic interests of the few and putting at risk the security of the whole. What is the role of the United States military in the world as a libertarian sees it? The role of the United States military as a profound organization end result libertarian society would not exist anywhere resembling the state it exists today. Even in our founding documents, the Constitution of the United States, there is no call for a standing army. There is actually specific prohibitions arguing against a standing army. The founding fathers thought a standing army was dangerous. But they did call for the existence of a militia, both organized and unorganized at the state level. 
that the states could organize the militia on a part-time basis to provide their own defense force. And we have that with the National Guard. The National Guard serves a vital security purpose in this country. They're the people who are trained. They're organized. They can be called upon on a minute's notice to respond to a threat or an invasion here in the United States. And, sure, the argument can be made that the National Guard is as competent and as well trained as it is only because of our involvement in the past 20 years of constant warfare. But maybe if we weren't so focused on building a grandiose standing army with over 800 military installations across the world outside of the United States and drawn ourselves so thin that we need to spend all that money, we could, with much less resources, dedicate training and resources to those militia units, to those National Guard units, empower the states to develop their own defense platforms. And the federal government's only role should be the coordination of defense in the event we are attacked. Is there truth in the statement that government institutions ultimately, while sometimes being well-intentioned, ultimately have to develop their own reason for continued existence and then ultimately continue to continue to support the problems and continue to create more problems that they were originally designed to combat? Is that true across oh, the board? Oh, yeah. I, I always say there's no problem that can't be made worse by passing a new law. But the inherence there of what a government agency has to do to justify its own existence, you can look basically at the way Washington, D.C. defines a budget cut mm -hmm. as to the mentality with which they operate. Um, every budget for every office, every department, every single employee in D.C. is set to increase by X percentage per year. Now, if Congress passes a budget where instead of increasing it by 7%, we only increase it by 3%, they call that a cut in spending, regardless of that we're spending 3% more than we did the previous year. They've gotten away from the need to justify their own existence, right now they're justifying their own increase in existence. Um, me personally, I would love to take a pay cut that pays me 3% more every single year. <laughs> now, but until we get away from that argument, we'll never get away from the way they justify their own budgets and their own needs. Regardless, now the big argument that Trump cares, the Trump care health care bill, which no one actually knows what's going to be passed or what final form it will take, will kill millions of people because it's going to cut Medicaid, doesn't take into the fact that the bill that was presented by the Senate actually increased Medicaid spending 36%. But they said that was a drastic cut because it didn't go up by the 51% Obamacare has scheduled to over the next 10 years. It doesn't change the fact that we're going to be spending more on a broken system that justifies its own existence by its failures. The, the, the more health issues that arise out of Medicaid patients because they're not receiving the quality of care that they could from the free market in a timely manner, the more it's needed to spend on them and they justify the need for their own expansion by their own failure. Huh. Let's talk about education. You're a recent student. What are we doing wrong in education today? Why is our educational system in crisis on so many levels? As someone who really has no background in education, I'm ill-suited to actually give an in-depth answer on that, but I, I tend to defer to a, there's a woman in New Hampshire who runs a foundation on education choice, Ms. Kate Baker. She has fantastic views, and I encourage everybody to look up her organization and what they're doing for school choice in New Hampshire. Um, I will get you her information for that later. Uh, but I break it down to the simplest. Nobody, nobody knows what a child needs for its education better than its teachers and its parents. And the very concept of the Federal Department of Education existing lends to the notion that some bureaucrat 3,000 miles away knows how to raise your kids better than you do. Mm -hmm. Someone who's never met your kids, who's never seen their progress, who doesn't know their unique situation, can dictate how they are allowed to learn. And that is something we need to get away from. We need to put control of education back in the hands of parents and teachers and take it out of the government altogether. Some would argue for the complete separation of school and state. That's the radicalist idea. Let's stop funding schools altogether. Let communities come together to educate themselves. 
Sure, someday that might be the way we want to go, but the incrementalist steps we are currently taking, we are expanding school choice in New Hampshire. We are, uh, there was a ballot measure last year that was very narrowly defeated to expand school choice in Massachusetts. Um, and it's becoming a trend across the country to give parents more choices and alternatives on how their children are educated. Anywhere in the country right now, you can choose to homeschool your child as long as you provide what the state considers a minimal level of care. Well, there are private market, free market alternatives to education out there, the Khan Academy being one of them. The Khan Academy provides free. I, don't, I can't speak to their business model because I've never seen it, but they provide free education alternative where K through 12, a student can log on and complete all of their coursework from kindergarten through 12th grade um, with accredited coursework as a homeschooled student, and those students are graduating earlier, they're going on to better colleges, they're having seen higher earning potential because it's self-structured learning and self-paced learning. The one-size-fits-all approach of education is failing this country. Hmm. What about, let's get into the war on drugs. This, you know, some will think about this, is, this for a libertarian, this is almost, I'll call it legislative t-ball. But We've spent a lot of time in with earlier segments that you, you weren't privy to, but we spent a lot of time talking about the opioid epidemic. Is the war on drugs working at any level? The war on drugs is failing at every level. Um, one of the big problems we have in New Hampshire is a program called Granite Hammer Shield. It's the state dumping money into fighting the opioid epidemic and forcing heroin users to leave and uh, making sure that everything is good and kosher, and it's not solving the inherent issue from the problem. Oregon, actually, just took what I think is the best step any state in this country has taken to fighting the opioid abuse problem. They decriminalized it. Mm -hmm. The state of Oregon decriminalized not just opiates and heroin, but also marijuana, ecstasy, cocaine, and several other hard drugs, where it's no longer a criminal penalty for possession. Um, what we're doing when we're criminalizing addicts is sure there's a link to the argument that addiction is not a disease addiction is a choice that is your own fault who cares about that argument it's non-constructive and it only hurts our case regardless addiction is not a crime the only victim within an addict is the addict himself they're not victimizing anybody else they're not infringing on anybody else's rights however when you make them a criminal that changes because when you make an addict a criminal, you're taking away resources that they should have at their disposal, like health care. An addict is, most addicts are afraid to seek health care because several laws require the doctor's report to the police when somebody comes in with needles. Uh, addicts can't see quality control with their product because their dealers and illegal dealer. There is no market controls on their process, so they lose the court system. Their Alex can't call 911 when one of their friends overdoses because they're afraid they'll go to jail. Right. By decriminalizing the activity, we destigmatize. And by allowing people access to the resources for their own benefit and for their own well-being, we see an increase in them utilizing those resources. Mm -hmm. uh, in Portugal, when they decriminalized all drugs, more people started going to rehab. More people actually started getting clean. Overdoses dropped drastically. And instead of sending addicts to jail, making them go cold turkey, and then releasing them with a felony so they can't get a job, forcing them to go back to the life they knew before, they see people getting the medical help they need, going to rehab, getting clean, and then they're getting back into society without a criminal record, without the stigma of being a felon, finding themselves gainful employment, and turning their lives around into a more productive manner rather than going back to the drugs once they get out. Uh, and places like Portugal have seen great success with that uh, ideology, and I foresee Oregon, uh, so long as the federal government stays out of their way, I foresee Oregon having great success with it as well, and it's a program I'd love to see implemented in New Hampshire and all of New England as the New Hampshire-Massachusetts border right now is kind of the focal point of the opioid epidemic in the country. We've only got a couple of minutes left. Folks, if you're just tuning in, of course, this is The Coalition. 
Justin O'Donnell, Libertarian Fabulous candidate for the second congressional district, is joining us tonight. Live now, hopefully within the safe confines of the Liberty State, of course, you know, the state of perpetual freedom. Of course, we're talking about New Hampshire. Tell folks where they can find out more about your campaign. Most importantly, how they can donate. And what are your plans in the, in the coming months and as, as the election draws near? Where can we see Justin O'Donnell campaign? What type of approach are you going to take? Well, as early as tomorrow, I'll be at the Strap and Fair in New Hampshire. I'll be opening up the table for the whole Libertarian Party of New Hampshire. I'll be there with Jaletta Jarvis. She's right now running for governor of New Hampshire in 2018 as our Libertarian candidate. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll be running the booth at the Strap and Fair, reaching out to constituents and voters from all across the state. Um, my website, you can learn more about me and my policies on my website, is odonnell2018.com. That's O-D-O-N-N-E-L-L-2018.com, uh, on our platform page. Our biggest concern right now is fundraising, what we want to do. Um, the donate tab on our page, you can go to there, you can go to the pledge page. We have a money bomb schedule coming up for the first week of August where we want to raise $5,000 in one week to build the momentum and show that our campaign can be what uh, everything it can be. Uh, our Republican candidate in our opposite district just made the news for raising 100000 in two weeks. Now, we're not expecting his levels. I think libertarians are capable of raising that money, but we need to show we can get off the ground first. Uh, what we plan on doing is more of a digital outreach in the immediate future. Uh, we're, we're looking to raise the money to purchase the camera equipment, set up a studio. We're going to be filming all regular uh, video series uh, not just myself, but State Representative Caleb Dyer, State Representative Brandon Finney, and State Representative Joseph Salkoff, as well as Governor's candidate Jaletta Jarvis. We're not campaigning as individuals. The Libertarian Party, as you've mentioned earlier, our cult of personality is the cult of liberty itself. Mm -hmm. We're campaigning as an idea. We are a whole ticket, up and down, from state rep to governor, um, from school board to U.S. Congress. We are all in this together. And my campaign will be heavily focused on coordinating with all those running in my district as libertarians, as making sure that everyone gets out there, everyone's names are known. Our door knockers will be there, hey, Justin's running for Congress, but you know what? Caleb's running for State House, too. He needs your support as well. We need to raise the funds to build that production value, to get that out there, so we can do that video series because we don't anticipate people will want to come and give money not knowing who I am. Sure, I'm very well known within the libertarian movement in New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. Outside of our core constituency, the people that we see at every convention, the people who are out there petitioning with me, the bulk of people in New Hampshire don't actually know who I am. We need to create a way for them to get face time with me, whether that's digitally or in person. Um, right now, we're still 15 months up from the election. We want to utilize social media and YouTube and get viral and let people actually come in and engage with our videos. We'll do topical videos, platform pieces, talk about what we're doing to promote liberty in New Hampshire and invite feedback and response. We want the people of New Hampshire to get to know me, to get to know our state rep candidates, to get to know our gubernatorial candidates, and then commit to fundraising and then commit to volunteering and finally and then to commit to casting that vote next November. Because ultimately if we learned one thing from the 2016 election, if the libertarian ideals, the philosophy, the movement is explained in a, in a clear, cogent manner to the individual voter, most people realize that they are in fact libertarians, that they support personal liberty, they support self-determination, they don't believe government should have an outsized role in their life. They believe the government should have little or no presence. That individual choices, sure. whether it be their sexuality, whether it be their religion, the style of education that they want to afford themselves and or their children, how drug addiction is handled, how any one of a number of social issues are handled should be a level of personal choice afforded to the individual who under the non-aggression principle should be capable of running their own lives as long as it accrues no harm to others. Once that's explained to them, we are all libertarian, aren't we? Right, and I think one of the best explanations of that philosophy, one of the best people I've ever seen explain that, somebody who's been a huge influence to me, um, somebody who I consider a personal friend, someone who I lean on for advice, um, Larry Schatz, who was running for governor of New York in 2018, um, and who's 
reach out and speak to anybody. And he has a great video series that he's put out uh, with libertarian leadership, uh, with his own Larry Sharp video uh, YouTube series, where that is one of his core things is you are a libertarian already. And that is something that every new libertarian, everybody who asks me what the first book they should read, because of that philosophy and the way Larry explains it, I tell them to go read Jim Bouchard's book. That crazy, angry libertarian. Jim ran for U.S. Congress in the state of Maine last year as a write-in candidate for the libertarian ticket, and he wrote his book about his campaign, and the, founding, the fundamental theme of the book was when Jim explains that he never became a libertarian. He reached a point in his life where he realized he always was one. What a great way to close out the night. Justin O'Donnell, thank you so much for joining me on short notice. You will be a regular participant in this show in the run-up to the 2000. 18, both the congressional election in New Hampshire and elections writ large. Folks, you are listening to the Coalition Talk Radio on the Worldwide Coalition Network. Broadcasting live from the Go Local Live Center here at 90 Way Boston Street in the city we love, the, the naked city, the mean streets of Providence, the city of truly a thousand stories. All evening we've been treated to folks who, like Justin and like our prior guests, Hashtag, take it very, very personally. Find the inner libertarian in you. And join us next week, because we will be back. Justin, thanks so much. Everyone, have a great week. Follow us at coalitionradio.us. There's plenty more. To